So, this, this looks pretty cool. Yeah, we're holding JC's uh, sixth grade supply list, which we're going to go shop for today, along with a few clothes. Yeah. So, we're as, go as, as almost every other parent in America is doing right now. Only we go, we, we do go to Goodwill, right? We're friends of Goodwill. Well, yeah. I mean, you don't have to go bankrupt to buy clothes for school. I mean, it's inexpensive. They sell very good clothes and you get them for a very good price. And mm -hmm. Goodwill is not paying us for a commercial. But we've been customers for a long time. Mm -hmm. Hi guys, hi friends. Pastor Jenny here, and this for those of you that don't know him, many of you know him, but this is my husband John McIntyre. Yes, I am behind the scenes. I am secretive, and nobody knows who I am. He is not secretive. And since JC is behind the camera, I'm gonna ask him to come here real quick just to say hi. Come on, JC. He's the kid with red hair. Yeah. Hello. He's drummer, drummer extraordinaire. In our yeah. Our worship team. Yeah. His hair is over his eyes right now. He can't see. Yeah, it. but when you see him to show him your eyes, all he does is he opens them real big, but he does not take the hair. What, what's up with that? Uh, uh, Are you sure you can see? Yeah, I can see like really clear. Okay, green five. Yeah. All right, so Thank we're going to put the schedule here at a side because today I promise you guys that John and I were going to do a series about marriage. And John and I always laugh a little bit about when we talk about doing a series for marriage, right? Because we steal. We are unusual and do not do this at home, okay? Um, we, and we don't have it all together, right? We still struggle. Last time I checked, no. No, we have been, we've been married for over 20 years, but and it's been an interesting ride. Yeah, up and down, up and down, sideways, all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, look at us, right? Like, dark Hispanic. Yeah, look how unhappy we look. See? I know. Well, I look happy. He this looks... is a fake video. It's yes. not true at all. It's We're trying fake. to pretend happiness. It's a fake video. In reality, there's a lot of trouble, turmoil in our relationship. No, no, but really, there, you know, we've, we've had kind of, I mean, we married when I was 29 and a half, and you? 37. Yeah. So we, well, yeah, almost 37, right? I guess going Because we married 37. in December, so I... I was I'm, 37 by then. Oh, you were. We got married in October in my sister's house. That's to get, true. To get you uh, on the fast track to getting a green card, get back in the country. Because I, I'm Panamanian you know, and I was living in Panama. We returned to Panama. Panama. We got a big church wedding in Panama. We moved, moved back to Wisconsin on December 31st and a blizzard hit. So welcome to the United States for Jenny. Yeah. And One day we were vacationing or honeymooning in Panama with flip-flops and sandals and shorts. And the next day we were in co the cold tundra of mm -hmm. Wisconsin. And then a few months later we had a uh, reception and a renewal of vows in a little town called DeForest, Wisconsin, just north of Madison, Wisconsin, where I spent about <laughs> Bring 20, that picture, Jason. Bring that picture. years of my life. So until last year... So go, go Badgers, go Packers. Yeah. Woo! Until last year, he would say that we had how many weddings? Uh, we're the, we were the only people that have had three weddings with no divorces in between. But now it's four. Now it's four, JC. Show, show. Close right. up. Close up. We had yeah. another renewal of vows in December of last year. Show yes. Us. So we now have had four wedding ceremonies with no divorces. No divorces in between. in between. So we are in the Guinness Book of World Records if we made an effort to do that. Not that we haven't been about to like choke each other at times. Yeah, she she would choke more than I would. Yeah. Yeah. As in choke you I'm or not, get I have a pacifist, nonviolent. She's yeah. a Latino who uh, well, we won't talk about that. You know why? He he's your American, typical American who's like looks like really peaceful but in reality he's really passive aggressive so i'm like ah, and he's like mm -hmm. no i'm irish and the holy spirit has calmed me down oh wow mm -hmm. well i have the holy spirit too yeah but you're not irish and he hasn't calmed me down irish have a habit of drinking a lot <laughs> and going to taverns and pubs and this was my my youth with my mom and dad i spent a lot of times in taverns play, playing pinball and jukebox. So. What does that have to do with your temperament? <laughs> well, I'm just saying my dad was a very angry alcoholic 
and a lot of Irish people get in a lot of fights uh -huh. and are hot headed and I've never kind of really had that tendency. Oh, but you married someone yes. that kind of reminded you of that yes. volcano type. The only time I ever hit Jenny was I had a dream <laughs> and I dreamed I was being attacked by werewolves yes! and I started punching her. Uh -huh. and, and she like woke up, what are you doing? And then when I said that, he started hitting me harder. Yeah. And then when he finally woke up completely, I'm like, why were you hitting me? And he told me the story about the werewolves. And I'm like, and then when I called your name, why did you hit me even harder? And you know what he said? He said, well, it's because then I realized I wasn't dreaming and the werewolves were real. <laughs> That's what he said. What are you going to do? The, the excuses some men will use to physically abuse their their his their wives. Yeah, one time. If so only much physical abuse. I know. If only I could speak English. This... Unconscious physical abuse. <laughs> yes. So, well, anyway, let's talk about how we met. This is going to be, I promise you guys, a series about our marriage, which is going to be a lot of fun because we are like very goofy, particularly when we're in front of a camera, and we're gonna do a series. I want to call it "Marriage Over." He doesn't think that's a good title, but it's my channel, so it's going to call Marriage Over. And we're going to talk about how, what are the things that we've done that could potentially mean a marriage is over. But before we go there, we are going to talk about how we met. And by the way, why do you think we're doing this, baby? Why are we doing this? Because you ordered me to do it. <laughs> yes, that's part of it. The other reason why we're doing this is because we have a, we want... Casey's laughing. In the yeah, he is. He's laughing so much. Our kids laugh all the time. Actually, we always... They laugh at us. At us. We Talk all, about us behind our back giggling. We embarrass them all the time. And I always tell them, if you're not rolling your eyes, I'm not doing a good job as a mother. My job in life, besides raising you, is to embarrass you in public. So. Or you don't have teenagers or tweens. Exactly. Which, uh, ups the ante of eye rolling. In a so. completely different video, I will interview both JC and Astrid. They claim to have combined powers, but that's material for another video. Let's go right into how we met. Okay, we this, this occurred in the dark ages of the internet. I believe the internet first came on in 95, and it was small and it gradually grew, but still in 1998, it wasn't huge. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend who was a computer whiz, and uh, I don't know, he kept saying, John, you need to get a computer. I didn't have a computer back then. I didn't see a need for it because I wasn't really into the internet. Talk about so the I, dark ages, people. 98. So anyway, I bought a computer, and then he said, John, John, you need to get on the internet. And I'm like, okay. So I got on the internet, and then I just, you know, you surf the internet. This is back in dial-up days, okay? Yeah, we like, there was no high-speed internet or anything like that. So anyway, I would get on there and go to different websites, and there were like ads, you know, how they would flash or turn up on these websites. And one was for Christian singles, Christian dating kind of thing. And it was called the Christian Connection Matchmaker System. I think that's like the precursor of what today and is it's Christian since, mingle. Right? And yeah, it's since disappeared probably a long time ago. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, but uh, there was two ways you could meet someone. You could either do a geographic search uh, within 20 miles, 30 miles, 50 miles, whatever. And then you could also, there would be people online, just like Facebook today, in the chat section. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like every time I would log on to the website, there was this person who went by the name of Lindsay, who had also logged on in a, within a matter of minutes, before or after I Super did. Super early. And so I'm like, who is this person? So I started sending messages. And Okay, stop. Now, know. my turn. Yeah. Okay, so... On April 19, I had turned 29 years old. Mm. I was known at church as a very cold girl because I was a wedding planner for the weddings of all my friends. But at age 29, I still had not had a formal boyfriend or, you know, a relationship. And, uh, but on April 19, I had already been feeling a little, you know, kind of lonely, starting to feel. I was practicing law. I was doing human rights. I was the leader at church but I was starting to feel kind of lonely. 
I had asked God not to um, not to allow me to really fall in love with anybody until I found the man that was going to be my husband because I really that, didn't have time for all that drama. But I remember when I turned nine. Are you really in the picture? I am. Right, yes. JC? I'm in the picture, right? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. But then, um, so I remember um, my baby niece, Liz Victoria, was only three days old because she was born on April 16th. And on April 19th, that was my birthday, mm -hmm. I got on my knees mm -hmm. and I, I, I told Lord, I said, okay, God, I'm ready. I need you to send me team now. And team stood for total integrity and wonderfulness, which really it, it doesn't translate with an Maravilloso. Instant. Maravilloso. So it was total Integro and maravilloso. Those three characteristics that I really like in in would like in a husband. Um, and even though that is me to a T, she still chose to do a criminal background check on me. I did, but you're like fast forward. Yeah. Fast forward. So, no, so no, I think they should know. They should. Things. You should totally know it because that is very important. When you meet someone that lives three thousand miles away from you and you've never seen them. And I mean, she's a lawyer, but she was a lawyer, by the well, way. Well, and I'm sure you guys have seen like the documentaries, like the Law and Orders, the the in, uh, Investigation Channel, the Dateline, where there's like horrible stories of people that meet people in the internet. And when I met him, the only people you met in the internet were sexual predators. Not that he's one, but back men, right? Yeah. yeah. So I had to run a background check. And so if you're dating somebody online, uh, please, you know. On a background check. You know that he only discovered I ran a background check on him like three or four years ago. I was giving advice to someone. He was driving, I was in the car, and I was talking to one of my spiritual daughters. I'm like, yeah, you have to run a background check. Just as I ran one on John, and he turns and he says, oh, you ran a background check on me? I was hugely offended. He was. Yeah. But I was safe. You always have to play it safe. At any rate, I asked I never him, ran one on her. Look at this face. She could have been a scammer. She could have could these wanted face, a convenience marriage. You know, could this face uh, every, ever yeah. be dangerous? Yes. <laughs> Stop it. When the camera stops rolling, ooh. Then things get really, yeah. really bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Jason's so at, box in the air. Yes. Right. He knows. He knows the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at any rate, I had asked God to send me my team, which has been the fictitious name I had given to the man that was going to be my husband since I was 19 because I was being, I had been praying since I was 19 for the man that was going to be my husband and to the long story short that was my prayer on April 19 and on April the 26th I got the first message from this guy and the reason I was in that website because I want to let everybody know that I wasn't necessarily you know super enthusiastic about meeting someone online. Um, I guess I haven't thought about it. Uh, but the reason I was there is because I was working for the armed forces, the US armed forces in Panama, while I was attending law school. And I saw a little commercial, just like he did, that kept saying like, meet people in a Christian environment, blah, blah, blah. I was doing an investigation of Christianity online for uh, religious discrimination. And that thing came up over and over and finally after seeing that i don't know how many times i'm like oh i'll just click on it it's free i clicked on it mm -hmm. and the rest is history i don't think i ever paid one penny for that membership because yeah. i because i met I, I i met him maybe you did but i didn't i met him like literally like two or three days after i i uh checked in mm -hmm. and so um he wrote to me i wrote back and that's how things start. And then we decided to exchange personal email addresses, so we started doing that. And then we started deciding to uh, make phone calls, and we ran up one month, I think it was about $700 phone bills. Yeah, but he's fast forwarding. The thing is that yeah. I sent him an email from work, and he saw and my phone number in my signature block. So phone number, all that kind of stuff. So he I surprised me with it. It said G E N E, and I assume Jean, but that's short for Geneva in Spanish. Which, as you guys know, I'm Jenny. like I'm like Jean McIntyre, and people think I'm an Irish man, and then they meet me and they realize that I'm not an Irish man, that I'm actually mm -hmm. Jenny Algandona, which is Betancur Garrido de McIntyre. Uh, but short for you guys. Wow, are yeah. you bored? 
No, I'm just tired. Every time I talk, I just bored to death. But no, I'm tired. Half he half cannot half. even pretend. With, even, even, even for you guys, he can pretend. Okay, moving on. Moving right along. So we both decided to pray, fast, seek God's advice, maybe through people. And, you know, we all kind of got signs. We both got signs that were... Amazing signs. You know, that were... Um, <laughs> I was having, uh, you know, a lunch with a friend of mine. Not that I'm advocating that, but um, we, I was at a Chinese restaurant and after dinner, you, what do you do? You open a fortune cookie. Oh, fortune cookies. And I don't know why I didn't save this. We love this. the fortune cookies. I don't know why I never saved this, but it, I know. it said, the woman you are about to marry will bring you luck and be your guiding star. That would be me. So God, so you God spoke to me through a fortune cookie. And I was also praying and fasting, and uh, I was driving a van for disabled people, lift van at the time. And I was behind this car that said for Panama on its license plate. So I guess I was stalking a little bit. So I drove into the parking lot where he lived and he got out and I said, excuse me, sir, uh, are you from Panama? He said, no, but my wife is. And I'm like, okay, you know, so we're hers are kind of even more dramatic of so, we were fasting and praying during this and time. we and we had devoted this seven days for prayer and fasting now many of you that look at this channel are not believers uh, but always remember what i've told you everything that we're going to talk about is going to have our our bias because we're believers we're christians and god is very much a part of our life so we're just being honest about the way things happen and this happened during a seven day period of time where he and i decided we were going to fast and we were going to pray and we were gonna uh, we asked God to confirm to us that we were meant to be together. It was a big decision. It was in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I was in Panama. I had my legal practice. I was going. To, I was um, yeah, working for the years. I, I just have a lot of things going on. I was leader in church. Was a human rights activist. He had his own life in Wisconsin. So it was a big decision. We wanted to make sure. So we prayed and fasted for seven days. During those seven days, mm -hmm. those are the signs he got. I was um, in a hotel room working my way back from a business trip. And when I was in the hotel, it, I think it was like the first or the second day of this fast, I turned on the TV and there's a documentary about the best colleges in the United States. And the first one that was featured was University of Wisconsin in Madison, well, Wisconsin. I went there. Which is where he went. And Beautiful which is, campus, mm -hmm. great sports teams. And which is the town where he lives. So I was like, oh, oh, okay, okay. Okay. Then I get to Panama, back to the office where I was working for the U.S. Armed Forces, and I had a co-worker, and his name was Martin, and we were we were um, talking about a new benefits packet, and I'm like, I'm not getting it, I'm not understanding you, and he's like, okay, let me give you an example. Let's say that you're a military wife, and you're married to a guy from um, Madison, Wisconsin. Guys... I never heard the, re the rest of the example. I was in shock because until this moment, nobody knew that this guy ever even existed, right? I, mean, I knew. Well, you knew, but I mean, nobody in my circle. Very good, very good comment though. Mm -hmm. And guys, God knew. God knew. And guys, <laughs> this mom, last one. Mom, my dad, and my brother. Wow, so funny. Yeah. <laughs> You think he's so funny? Sarcastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but this third one, this third one was amazing. Okay. Because I was uh, part of the board members of my church in Panama. As I told you, everybody knew me as the girl that planned the weddings, but I didn't have a relationship. Nobody knew about John. Nobody knew I was dating anybody online. I don't think that at that time we could even call it dating. And guys, after a board meeting, uh, the lady that was responsible for um, uh, Christian education approached me and said, Jenny, I have something really strange to tell you because you don't even have a boyfriend, but I had this crazy dream. And at the end, I felt like God was telling me to tell you that someone's about to ask you to be his wife and you are to say yes because it's ordained by him. Yeah, like no words. Another sign that we asked, well, I mean, after that, those seven days, we were pretty convinced, right, that 
God yeah. had this crazy idea. And you know, my dad, he wasn't malicious about it necessarily, but you know, Wisconsin's lily white, okay? Yeah, very. And in his generation, there were a lot of jokes that would not fly these days that were ethnic jokes, things like that. And, you know, he, today he would probably be considered somewhat of a racist. I mean, he wasn't, he would never hurt anybody, but just the words he used and maybe the attitudes. Anyway, I just felt like, okay, if I'm going to marry this woman, I need to go to my parents, which throughout history, most people have done it that way uh, in the United States. That's for the, at least the last hundred years, probably not as common. But anyway, I just decided, I sat down with my mom and dad and I said, Dad, Mom, would you have a problem if I married somebody that wasn't white? And they just kind of looked at each other and they said, well, um, if you love her, son, it's okay. So, you know. That was important for me too, because, um, you know, although I had no idea, <laughs> I thought I knew about racism, but I had no, no idea until I really married John and, and moved to the United States. But it was very important for me at that point that John had that okay from his parents because don't believe the stories that you're not marrying his family that you're mm. only marrying him because that's I mean it's true to a certain extent but in well, reality most of our marriage we haven't been anywhere near my family most yes, of it most of it we haven't and, and that helps but in but in the majority of the cases not everybody can live so many miles away from your spouse's family. So you always have to look a little bit at the family. And I mean, I'm not saying it's the only factor, but mm -hmm. it is an important factor. Um, and so at least for me, it was important that I knew that at least his parents were aware and cognizant that I was not white and that they would be okay with us having a relationship. Mm -hmm. So let's see, we kept, you know, talking and praying and and uh, I guess, uh, was it over the phone? Did I ask Did I ask you over the phone or did I just go there and ask you when I met you in person? When you met me in person. Okay, so, so John already had tickets. So I bought a ring. He, I, got, I bought a, a ticket. She was going to be in Baltimore where there's a big military base called the Aberdeen Proving Ground. But before that, before he knew that, he had already bought tickets to Panama. He was going to right. meet me there, and, and, he was, and he was going to talk to you know fam her family, just to meet them, and which stuff was like that. which was an interrogation. It was exactly not a, uh, yes. So, but but then I had to go to Aberdeen Proving Ground. I was working again, as I said, for the U.S. Armed Forces. They had a training session there that I needed to participate in, and he said, "Oh, let me meet you. Let me meet you." was a little freaky for me because, you know, I never met him in person, but he said, I'll, I'll come and, you know, we'll, it'll just be a quick thing. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So now you take it away. So I got on a plane, went to Baltimore, drove up to the Proving Ground. Robert and and uh, I, I was running a little late and she was getting a little worried. But then finally I got there and I'm looking around and I'm like, Oh, I think that's her over there. So I yelled at her her name and she saw me and we kind of approached each other, gave each other a big hug, and then we felt like there was a third person giving us a big hug. Yes, we did. And it was amazing. Uh, yeah. So very few people have probably felt they've been hugged by God or the Holy Spirit, but that day it felt like it. Yeah. Very much. Very and, real. And when we've gone through very, very tough times um, as a couple, as all couples uh, go through them, I think memories like those, um, you know, mm -hmm. are things that have sustained us. The signs that the Lord gave us during that period of prayer and fasting mm -hmm. are things that have sustained us and mm -hmm. have helped us. Like, we're going to stick to this because we believe that God meant for us to be together, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he sees me. We gave, give each other that hug, God hugs us together, and then he decides that he's going to... Well, and then, I mean, obviously she was taking a leap of faith and trusted me, and we briefly went back to her apartment, because she wanted... To apartment, to the lobby of the hotel. Okay, whatever it was. Well, I didn't so, have an apartment. It okay, was. whatever it was. And we, she had to change, because we were gonna do something. Mm -hmm. So, she came out, sat down, and I got down on my knee and I opened the little thing and she goes like this and she goes <gasps> and she knocks the ring all the way across the room. Guys, that was 
I have to say that was May 23rd of 98. We had started talking on April 26th. I'm talking not even a month. So I knew that God had given us the signs. I knew that we were praying. I knew he was coming to Panama, but I never thought he was going to move so fast. So I was in shock. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time we ever saw each other in person. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Panama. No, 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 I did this and what happened? Well, then I put the ring back on you. Yeah, well, his, it, I knocked it out and he had to crawl I found it, find it. I found it. So then before we, I left Baltimore, we were pretty much on the road to marrying. We knew. Yeah. And I, I already, said yes. I already yeah. had my pre-scheduled trip to Panama in July. Um, and you know, I met everybody. I met his pastor who just kept staring at me during church services trying to figure out who is this guy. Um, I met her mom and got the third degree because, you know, she's a very uh, powerful, uh, almost overpowering woman, I guess you'd say. I can't say no to But that. I passed the interview. And then even her dad was there. And uh, he hadn't always been present in their life a lot. But he showed up for this. And we were talking, he was a baseball fan, and I, I could talk to him about that. And then right, at, right before I was leaving, he said, watch it, now watch it. And I'm like, at the time, I didn't know what the heck he meant by that. But I think it was his way of saying, marriage isn't easy, as I thought about that. So be careful, watch it. So anyway, uh, marriage is not easy, by the way. So then I got on a plane and went back to Pan. I went back to Wisconsin, and uh, several times between July and December, Jenny uh, was very sick or came near death through accidents. Uh, there was a flash flood in Panama, and her car was getting filled up, and some people ran and pulled her out of the car and rescued her. Guys, I, I, we couldn't make this up, even if I mean this. It, it, I, I know it sounds like a movie, but it truly, truly happened. And yeah. then she, she was very sick. She had fibromyalgia, a lot, of, a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one day she called me and, and was kind of talking in a way that I could tell she was, you know, not really, uh, how should I coherent. say, coherent. And I was scared. So somehow I managed to get, I called an operator in Panama had no idea how to how I'm doing this. I didn't even know how I was gonna get a hold of an operator. He didn't speak Spanish and, and, back then. Well, I, a little bit. A little bit, yeah. And then I asked her, I needed the number of the church called Teo Dynamica, which is where she went. And this operator found the number, called it, and somebody answered it and said, hola. And I, I said in Spanish, necesito hablar a Sammy El Gondona. That was her brother, Sammy. My, my brother who back then was... And I thought it was pretty clear Spanish, but I think, I said, uh, I, you, es, yo soy John McIntyre de los Estados Unidos. And I think she was so shocked that somebody from the United States was calling her church on a Sunday morning. It, it was like, it wasn't registering. And I kept saying... This was in the middle of the service. Necesito hablar... Con at Sammy Algandon. And finally, she's like, oh, un momento. And she goes to get Sammy, who spoke some English. And I said, Sammy, hey, something's wrong with Jenny. I just, you know, I talked to her. She doesn't sound right. And he's like, when? And I said, like, five minutes ago. He's like, okay. So the whole family left church, went home, and she was dehydrated. They said, basically, at the hospital, if we wouldn't have got her, she would have died. She yeah. would have died. There's something about me. Whenever I'm in pain, I start throwing up. And whenever I start throwing up, I get dehydrated. I mean, it's, it's been very, it's, it's been very, um, it's happened to me several times in my life. But that day was particularly hard and my whole family was at church. So mm -hmm. it, it was, and you know, but God definitely used John that day to, to save my life. He was in Wisconsin. I was in Panama and that right. was an important phone call. Right. I'm glad you decided to do that. Right. And uh, so we get married. And we go on our honeymoon, and there's a couple places we went on the coast. And one of the places, uh, it, it was all granite, like the back, the back steps, the backyard. And it was wet, and we walked out back there. And we were with her brother, Henry. Her he old, was dropping us, yeah. And he said, be careful there, you could slip. 
And I'm like, okay, I'm all right. But the next thing you know, woof, and I almost went head over heels and the back of my neck struck the, uh, the step, the granite step. And I didn't feel anything. And, you know, a little bit of stars, but, you know, hitting the back of your neck on something so hard, you could very easily break your neck. Yeah. And her brother said, well, the honeymoon was almost over before it started. So, you know, we had all these strange things happening. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, but we did get back on the plane. And, you know, Jenny went into culture shock when she had to come back and live in the United States. And Nothing would have to I think she's told me she considered leaving and going back home more than once. Um, I was so depressed, you guys. So you know, and I, you know, my family didn't, my family was very dysfunctional. We didn't really either celebrate holidays or my dad made our holidays so miserable. I almost wished we didn't have holidays. And I don't know why he was that way, but he just was that way. And when I wasn't such a holiday celebrator, Jenny came from a culture where everything was a party and happy yeah. and celebratory. Woo! And that depressed her a lot. Very. You know? It was truly a culture shock. Yeah. So well, then there was the black and white thing. And before she got her green card, she was pretty much stuck at home. Yeah. And, you know. We were first, waiting. We wanted to do things the right way. And right? at first, you know, I hadn't had a lot of, to save money, I, I had like live-in jobs taking care of disabled people. And usually I just had to be there at night. And then I would go do my other job. So she was stuck in the house with these people, some of whom weren't, weren't very nice. Yeah. And well, fi finally, we got our own apartment. She got her green card. She yeah. was able to get, um, you know, a, a job and everything. And so, you know, our life kind of developed from there. But we only stayed in Wisconsin, like, barely three years. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to come to Florida to go to Bible school. And she got a great job. So we came down here. And our first child uh, was born in 2002. That's Astrid, our superstar, mm. pop star girl. If you and haven't checked her out, check out her website. And Astrid her Facebook Big channel. Sings, A S T R I. -E she writes her own music. Astrid Vet and then sings one word, and that's her YouTube channel, Instagram. She's Twitter. won many awards. She's been on TV, she's been in musical theater. Singer she's songwriter. recording an album now, so we're bragging enough, but that's our daughter. Sorry. And our son now is a is a 11 year old drummer extraordinaire. Yes. And they're so jamming much. all the time in our music room. They do. And are you coming in front of the camera again? This the, the red haired guy again. Yes. yes. Um, so she was born in 2002, but Jenny. Uh, That's barely, my baby. It's Jenny had four, both her pregnancies was horrible. Uh, yeah. I yeah, I was shouldn't told, have had babies. She was told by doctors you'll never get pregnant because I had an inverted curvature on my spine that would have prevented me from carrying a baby. So I had to totally take care of her during both pregnancies. I was in. She was in a wheelchair for like the last four or five months. Yeah. Um, so I had to take leave of absences from work. Uh, one of them told her, oh, don't worry, uh, we'll keep your job. As soon as the baby was born, it's like, like sorry, for the baby. I'm sorry, got to let you go. Yeah, so. so anyway, after Astrid was born and Jenny was let go, my mom was already very sick with cancer. So we, we were thinking we should go back to Wisconsin. And it, very often in her life, she only had one very clear job offer. So it was very clear to us which job offer and the only job offer she got when we wanted to move back to Wisconsin was Gary what? Guess what? Madison, Wisconsin, where my family was. So, so we moved back. Water, so we moved back there, and we kind of stayed there till my mom passed away, and uh, we did some ministry in a church there, and then we came back to Bradenton, and we were like uh, kind of youth, young adult pastors um, for, for a little, little while. Mm -hmm. and, and, but, you know, during all this time, Jenny was very sick still with fibromyalgia. Um, she went through postpartum depression with Astrid. Oh yeah. Um, really bad. Um, and at some point we're going to make individual videos to talk about all these things because we think it's very important for you to know that even people that love God and follow God go through these struggles because sometimes when pastors paint a picture perfect life and and if we're not transparent then you can look at us and you're having all these struggles and these problems but you can relate to us because you think we have it all together so we believe in transparency so we're gonna we're gonna at some point we're gonna touch very specifically on those 
Thanks. And, and you know, she was kind of brought, she was brought up in a Pentecostal church and somebody's got in Panama and everything's supposed to be wonderful and put a smile Victory. on your face all the time. Positive confession. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Which, you know, there's a place for all of that. But, you know, when we got back to Wisconsin, you know, she was like this and I said, what Bible are you reading? Have you read the book of Job? Have you, have you read the Psalms? You know, and it kind of opened her eyes a little bit. You know, so to, this to guy, it. I mean, I owe him a lot of things. He's been such a blessing to me. But the one, one of the biggest gifts. But also a big irritation at the same time. Yes, yes, let's not forget. It's both sides. It's a balance. Both the kind, both sides. But one of the biggest gifts he ever gave me was the gift of being a transparent woman because I I was always like trying to be strong for my mom, strong for my brothers and sisters, strong because I was the leader in church. So I was always, I never let my guard down. I was always like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Even if I was dying, uh, even if we were going through troubles, but he confronted me just like he said, he said, what Bible are you reading? You know, and you, you spoke to me about Jeremiah, David, the Psalms. It's kind of funny because I have been reading all those books since I was a little girl, but I never allowed them to, to speak to me about how being phony and being fake and all this positive confession, confession thing can really separate you mm -hmm. uh, from people, right? Mm -hmm. Well, on the other hand, my family, you know, was obviously very dysfunctional and, you know, and just little things that can make a difference. Jenny would say, good morning. And at first, when we were married, I'm like, I wasn't saying anything. And she would get upset with me. And I, and I realized, you know, that starts the day off on a positive note, just saying good morning. Whereas when I grew up, it's like everybody got up and like went around their business. Nobody said hi. Yeah. You know? And one of the things that, that we're going to talk about in this series of Marriage Over, one of the things that can really cause a marriage to be over is that we all come to our marriages playing a record of what our upbringing has been like. And John was playing that record of everybody gets up, everybody, and he would go to bed without saying good night. Mm -hmm. No big deal, right? He was playing the record of his childhood. Mm -hmm. I was playing the record of my childhood where good mornings, good night were, were absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. And when he wasn't saying that, I was devastated. I thought he really didn't care about me, but it wasn't what mm -hmm. was going on. But it took me a while to get to that. Right. And you know, another thing she taught me, especially when we had kids, was to make sure I hugged everybody enough. Because people didn't hug or touch in my family. And that's a very important thing. But he's thing. a very huggy, touchy person. Yeah, now I've, I've learned to get over, <laughs> you know, yeah. being the distant, cold, European white American type person. Now he's mostly white outside, but very much a Hispanic inside, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, when, when we were first married, she used to say she'd stay up at night and just look at me because I literally glowed in the dark. He did, I have never I seen anything like it. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. he's a little that darker now because we've been living in Florida for a while, but back then, all the lights were off in our bedroom and I would just look at this glowing figure right next to me. He was like translucent. That's how white he was. He was incredible. So, um, so I mean, any day, anyway, you know, JC came along in 2008, another very difficult pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, at that point, her uterus was dis literally disintegrating. I believe the doctor said it was jelly. Yeah, he said, so I have no idea how you were able to carry a baby in He's this uterus. It's like a piece of rubber, he said. Mm -hmm. He's a miracle. Both both of our babies are miracles. Mm -hmm. But we are going to start wrapping this up because this video was mostly to give you the introductions of us as a couple because now we're going to get into, in the next episode, we are going to talk a, a lot more about our adjustment. We're going to talk about racism. I think the probably our first episode, our next episode after this one, is going to be about the perils of an interracial couple. Mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, I, I think it's a very relevant topic. Mm -hmm. And I we want to tell you all about our adventures mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's a few things that I want to leave you with. Uh, number one, if you meet someone online, make sure you get to know them and run a background check. Very important. If you 
I know that your reaction is, well, oh my God, how can I run a background? Well, you ask questions here and there, you know, first I ask him for his name, then on a complete different message, I ask for his birthday, then on a complete different message, I ask, what year were you born? And there you have it. I had his name and his date of birth, which is mostly what you need to run a criminal background check. It's not a bad idea. Actually, I think it's a must. A lot of terrible stories that I've read is because women or men had no idea what the criminal background of somebody else was, and if had they known that, they would have been able to be safe. What about meeting on a public place? You want to talk about that? Well, I mean, that's I would never meet in a place that there's you no one else there. Vulnerable in any way. Yeah. Don't ever do that. Yeah. I mean, when John and I met, we we met in the in the in the outside of a military installation, and then we went to have sandwiches, and then we were in the lobby of the hotel. So if he had been like a dark character, I would have been. It would have been very easy for people around me to tackle him down on the floor, or vice versa to me if I mm -hmm. had been the serial killer or something like that. Mm -hmm. What else can we say about? Um, just um, you know. Realize marriage is not Disney World. It's not it Disneyland. It's there's fighting involved. Guess what? People fight. Will you live with somebody every day? Um, there will be disagreements. But in our case, it's, it's been over twenty and, years, so and, we have a lot of those. And you need to. Some of the most important words you need to say is, uh, "I'm sorry." Please, will you will you please forgive me? Yeah, because then you put the power in the other person's hands mm -hmm. to choose to forgive. Mm -hmm. And just saying, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry," that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change. Yeah, it just means you got caught. Exactly. You know, so you have to be willing to change. Another very important thing that I would say about, you know, for for those of you that say, Ooh, "I would never meet someone online," is that, and and I we realize that online romance is not for everybody, but but in our case. I mean, at only at less than a month from writing to John, I felt like I knew him very, very well because when you meet someone in person, you know, there's attraction, there's hormones, there's all this thing, right? But when you just, when you're so far away from someone and the only way you're communicating is via, via letters or emails or whatever, you really get to know the person. I mean, you really, I remember I told him at one point, I said, you know, I really would like to get to know you, so I need you to write me more than just a few notes. And boy, did I regret saying that. I'm just kidding. Because the next thing he wrote, he wrote like a page and a half, and we kept communicating like that. So I really, really got to know him. I really got to know his heart, his mind. Um, and I think you got to know me too. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, you never know a person until you start living with them. Yeah, we didn't really have a so, formal date. You know, time. don't don't think you really know somebody. You know, and today people they live together before they get married, but you know that's not God's plan. You know, most of those relationships fail. Yeah. And then you have the guilt and the baggage of how many years or months or whatever living with another person, and you know you you compare that person to the next person and it really becomes very difficult. So, you know, just, you have to trust God and take yeah. a step of faith and do as much interacting with the person as you can and just hope it works. And you're gonna, you're gonna hear this yeah. from us, you're gonna hear this from us over and over and over again in this series. Love is not a feeling, it's a decision. Love is not a feeling, it's a decision. And John and I are here together after 20 years of marriage because we have decided that we are going to love one another and that we are going to stick to one another. And during these 20 years, we have felt a lot of negative emotion towards each other at times, right? Mm -hmm. He's been angry at me. I've been ang angry at him. He's been resentful at me. I've been resentful at him. Like, ah, I can't take this anymore. But feelings have not taken over our decision, right? God gave us a mind because he intends for this mind to control what we feel. And I know that this society works very hard to tell you, do what your heart tells you. No, don't do what your heart tells you. If John and I had managed our marriage based on how we felt, we would not be married, mm -hmm. right? We would not be here today. 
Um, and I'm not saying that our, our marriage doesn't have emotion. I'm not saying that our marriage doesn't have a spark, because trust me, it's very sparky. What I'm saying is, these are not the things that rule our marriage. They are ingredients, but they are not the things that rule our marriage. Um, love is a decision. And, 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 you know, some people, I remember I had a friend that in Panama that was con very concerned about me marrying someone that I had never slept with. And she said, how do you know you're going to be compatible? I gave her a very, very simple explanation. And I said, well, you know, when God brought Eve to Adam in the Garden of Eden, Eden, not Eden, Eden, um, Adam didn't have a point of comparison and neither did Eve. They had to trust that God was doing the absolute best for them. And that is exactly the way I believe John and I went about our relationship. We were single. We have been single for a long time. We didn't have a formal relationship. We had never been, you know, intimate with another person. And we had to trust that after we prayed and fasted for that week, God had made it abundantly clear that he meant for us to be together. We both believed. Mm -hmm. We both had similar goals in life. We had a lot of similarities in our, in which is very important because the Bible tells us Christians, we, we believe, and this is what the Bible teaches us, that we should always mate or be married with a person that has our same conviction about God. And that was, that was the first very important thing. But once we determined that, and once we prayed and fasted, and we knew that God was asking us to be together, then it was a matter of making a decision. You know what, I'm gonna stick with this person no matter what. And there's been a lot of hesitation at specific points of time in, in the last 20 years, but ultimately, by God's grace, He's helped us to stick to that original decision. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we've rambled for a long oh time. Oh my gosh, have we ever. I doubt I'd be, let us know if you watch this whole thing. Because, Ask questions. Because I don't know how many people watch the whole thing, but you know, maybe you've got something, bits and pieces. So. All we can do is try, right? We're trying to do something. We're hoping that, uh, that through all these series, we will provide inspiration and strength uh, to many couples and that if you're going through a difficult situation, if you need prayer, leave those comments. If you like this video, subscribe, like, and share. Um, and know that we are real people with real problems, with a real marriage. We have a perfectly imperfect love. That's what we have, right? Mm -hmm. Any parting words? Um, no, just uh, goodbye, see you next time, and uh, maybe we'll try and make it shorter next time. We promise. Yeah. We promise. Okay. Take care, JC. Bye. Bye. Our son is now going to shut the phone off. Bye, guys.